So today we will continue where we left off um, last time, which is uh, talking about uh, memory. Memory is uh, closely related to the default mode network, and this is a meta-analysis by Neurosyn of uh, 770 studies looking at the default mode network, which, as you know, is a network which is um, active when you're mind-wandering, when you're thinking about the past, reflecting about the future, and the default mode has, uh, consists of the PCC, um, pre-general anterior cingulate extending into the anterior, uh, extending into the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, uh, but importantly also some areas of the lateral um, aspect of the brain, the temporoparietal junction and the anterior mid-temporal area, but it also includes the hippocampus and the parahippocampal area. And this brings us to memory. Because if you do a meta-analysis of uh, 2,744 studies looking at memory, what you see is basically very overlapping areas, um, but of course with the four most um, important structures being the hippocampus extending into the parahippocampal area posteriorly um, and from there to the precuneus. Uh, but also the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is involved in working memory, as well as the parietal area, and this lower aspect of the temporal lobe, um, which is important uh, because uh, these three areas, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the inferior parietal area, and the tem occipital temporal uh, junction are actually forming the central executive network. Now, memory systems have been subdivided in different classes or different uh, kinds. There is declarative memory, um, and declarative memory can, comes in uh, two forms, in episodic memory and semantic memory. There is also non-declarative uh, memory, which basically means that it cannot be consciously uh, recollected, which um, has been subdivided in uh, procedural memory, uh, basically meaning skills and habits, uh, priming, which is cortically in its uh, generation, simple classical conditioning, which involves the basal ganglia as well as the amygdala cerebellum, as, and habituation and sensitization. What we will talk about most is declarative memory, meaning uh, memory that can be consciously recollected. Declarative memory comes in two forms, episodic memory and semantic memory. Episodic memory basically means that you can recollect unique events within their context um, and related to the self. So you, you travel in your personal history to collect uh, something which is very specific um, within, a spe within a certain context. Semantic memory, on the other hand, is... Uh, culturally shape more general knowledge in, in contrast to the uniqueness of episodic memory and it is detached from its context and devoid of any uh, subjective uh, travel in time. So it is, um, it is different from, uh, semantic memory is different from episodic memory in that it is general, detached from context and devoid of any subjective sense of mental uh, time travel. Now to um, make it a little bit more simple, memory can be divided in two systems. An anterior system, which recognizes the specifics, and a posterior system, which recognizes the context. The posterior system, the context recognizing system, involves the retrosplenial part of the, um, of the posterior cingulate cortex, as well as the parahippocampal area, and are basically two parts of the default mode network. Um, the anterior component involves the lateral orbital frontal cortex and the amygdala, as well as the ventral temporal polar cortex are basically more the emo emotional um, aspects of specific uh, memory. Now, both anterior and posterior system actually integrate into the hippocampal uh, formation. So, the hippocampal formation basically integrates specifics within a specific, uh, within a certain context. So you've got the anterior, anterior uh, perirhinal system, which basically recognizes 
um, familiar things uh, such as objects, people and words and it does recognize the specific aspects of it. So it will recognize one uh, specific time, one specific uh, face, um, whereas the parahippocampal posterior uh, system basically recognizes um, contextual memory, uh, the context in itself. And this is then the uh, anterior and posterior networks are linked to the self via the uh, retrosplenial um, cortex. Because what happens in the retrosplenial cortex is that it has a, um, a flip-flop mechanism where you can both encode information into memory as well as retrieve information from memory and that occurs in the, um, in the posterior singlet cortex. So if you have memory encoding, basically encoding involves the parahippocampal area and extending into the hippocampus and the amygdala. Whereas if you retrieve it, basically what you, um, you pull memory and you have to relate it to yourself. So you pull memory via the, uh, the default, the posterior part of the, of the singlet into what you can clearly recognize as the entire default mode network. Um, but associated with that, you also have um, your rostral part of the interior singlet, which as we know is involved in, sal in salience detection. So the salience will determine what you will pull from uh, contextual memory. And this is then processed in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the superior part, a more superior part of the parietal area, which of course is then your central executive um, uh, or working memory component. Now, the parahippocampal um, gyrus um, basically links the default mode network with the medial temporal lobe memory system. So it's the link between self and uh, memory and therefore it can um, link place time and person meaning context um, in relation to the self now within the parahippocampal area you've got different parts you can you have the parahippocampal place area uh, adjacent to it is the fusiform face area um, and a little more lateral you and anterior you will find uh, information from scenes and information from time will come from uh, more posterior and medial areas. So all this information both from scenes, from time and from faces will then um, ultimately be processed in the parahippocampal area and therefore is perfectly suited to give uh, information about time, place and person to be then integrated into the self percept. So, um, and this is confirmed by a meta analysis where you see that time is processed in a posterior, um, more medial part of the um, parahippocampal area. The place is located a little bit just an um, anterior of the uh, time area, and that face is actually even more anterior of the place and time area. Um, so these meta-analysis confirms this uh, beautiful concept. Now the contextual network, because parahippocampus is just an area, and of course we don't want to uh, limit ourselves to a phrenological approach of um, brain processing. So the contextual network involves the parahippocampus, the posterior, sing uh, the, uh, posterior singlet cortex, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and the inferior parietal area, and the anterior temporal. So basically, your default mode network. Now, um, context in itself, if you do a meta-analysis of that, you will find, of course, a lot of activity in the parahippocampal area, as you can see here, extending to the uh, uh, social cortex, um, as well as to the uh, ventrolateral prefrontal, uh, prefrontal cortex. Now, context in itself is derived from the two Latin um, words. One is con, which means together, and texere, which means weaving. So context means woven together. So time, place, and person is woven together with the specific memory item that you're pulling from memory. Now, and if you fail 
um, to uh, suppress specific memories, that's when you develop um, post-traumatic stress. And this has been done in a, in a study that was recently published in Science, where the connectivity um, between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is part of your central executive control or your frontal parietal control network, that um, this actually, this control network, um, basically, when it uh, loses it links to the parahippocampal or uh, hippocampal memory area, then you can um, basically reduce the or disconnect the memory uh, from the dorsolateral prefrontal control uh, system. So basically, the memories are not being pushed into working memory mode, and therefore you're not consciously um, engaging into those memories. Now. How does memory then, how is it stored in the brain? Well, it is um, hypothesized and there has been some data that do show that memory formation is actually associated with uh, changes in histone and DNA modification. So basically, it's, um, it's an epigenetic mechanism where um, the information via BDNF and calcium, which we've seen before, of course, uh, modifies your memory activator or memory suppressor genes and so what happens is that when you have an initial uh, blank slate where all the neurons are not yet tagged epigenetically modified by um, a specific um, memory in induction that a specific memory will tag different neurons differentially and when in a later phase uh, this results in, in long-lasting changes in um, in memory genes and this will then ultimately result in a different activation uh, whenever the same memory is pulled uh, from, uh, from the context. Now, do we only have memory in our brain? Well, this mechanism, of course, this epigenetic modification of uh, memory genes can also be um, uh, translated and applied to muscles. So the idea of muscle memory, uh, which could appear as a little bit um, uh, fictitious, actually might uh, involve the same mechanisms where it's ultimately an ep epigenetic uh, modification of um, memory genes via a similar mechanism as in uh, brain cells. Now, this is a very short introduction to uh, larger scale networks involved in memory in humans. Um, and as we've seen, contextual memory has to be brought to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and parietal area, to the frontal parietal control network, in order to be consciously uh, retrieved. So what is this frontal parietal attentional control network? When you... Uh, uh, parcelate the brain in different uh, different networks actually uh, there is a dorsal attentional network which has been shown here in green which involves the frontal eye field the superior parietal area extending into the uh, occipital temporal junction um, but there is also the uh, ventral attentional network which involves more the ventral and prefrontal cortex inferior parietal area and superior superior occipital temporal uh, parietal junction area. So there's the dorsal and the ventral attentional network. And then there, but these are still different from the frontal parietal control network, um, which has also been called the central executive network. So the frontal parietal control network can actually be subdivided in two systems. One um, system which co-activates with the dorsal attentional network and one uh, which you can see here and one system which co-activates with the dorsal medial uh, dors uh, default mode network basically um, a system so the frontal parietal control network can co-activate with externally oriented attention via its co-activation with the dorsal attentional network or um, it can uh, be connected to the default mode network when you're mind wandering as shown in, um, in, in, in this slide. So from a practical point of view, the frontal parietal control network or the central executive network, depending on the, whether it is uh, 
relates its attention to the external world or to the internal world, um, it will connect, uh, but actually it's a subsystem of um, the front of rider control network. Now, what is the main goal of our brain, as we said before? The most important reason why we have a brain is to ultimately reduce inherent uncertainty in a changing environment. So, if you want to reduce uh, uncertainty, that's, uh, you need to be able to process the information that comes from the environment and link it to contextual memory, all based on what the intention or goal is of um, what you want to do at a certain moment. Now, uncertainty in itself involves a area of the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex that is extends into the rostral anterior singlet as well as the insula, so basically a salience network component associated with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, parietal area and occipital temporal junction, basically our frontal parietal control network. So basically our frontal parietal control network is capable of reducing uncertainty in the environment uh, which, um, which is of course very salient because uncertainty by definition is um, salient. And these areas that cor um, not just show up uh, associated with the presence of um, uncertainty, but they are um, correlate with the amount of uncertainty that is present in the environment. So it's a true uncertainty network. Now, the frontal parietal control network and the salience network are basically um, allowing control, cognitive control um, of goal-directed behavior. Um, what, it, uh, what that means is that you have a specific goal um, in mind that you want uh, to, proceed, to pursue, and, uh, but there is uncertainty how and when you can pursue this goal and uh, this uh, is controlled by the frontal parietal control network. And so uh, cognitive control can basically uh, involve um, executive control, and executive control in, um, can be subdivided in different uh, uh, parts. Uh, executive control basically means uh, you might need to, to uh, process conflict, you might uh, need some mental flexibility, you might inhibit uh, specific ideas or plans that you have, but you also have to create plans. So executive control involves all of these um, subdomains and is uh, ultimately um, controlled by the, uh, by the both combination of the salience network as well as the frontal parietal uh, control network. Uh, but not only executive control is part of um, or, or controlled by the front parietal control network and salience network, so is working memory uh, with both its spatial and verbal um, subdomains as well as decision making. So from a practical point of view, this um, front parietal control network has as main functions um, to uh, direct um, behavior under uncertainty uh, by using executive control, working memory, and decision making. Now, the front operator control network has also been called the central executive network, and this has, um, um, so involves the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and free parietal area and the temporal, uh, temporal occipital uh, junction, and it has been suggested that um, just like the body's immune system is protected against symptoms of bodily disease, that the frontal parietal control system actually is uh, protected against symptoms of uh, psychological or mental disease. Um, a practical example is that if you live in a neighborhood where uh, there is a high murder rate, of course this is uh, associated with an increase of uncertainty processing, um, that when you live in such a neighborhood, that this is associated with higher cardiometabolic risk, which in itself is, um, is expressed as obesity, insulin re uh, resistance, and uh, metabolic syndrome, which you find commonly, uh, basically metabolic syndrome is an autonomic dysfunction in uh, patients with um, obesity. Now, 
If you live in a neighborhood with a high murder rate, with, of course, increased uncertainty, um, this uh, cardiometabolic risk uh, basically is um, only apparent when um, young people have uh, lower central executive um, network connectivity, meaning that your frontal parietal control network cannot reduce uncertainty uh, well enough and this then leads to secondary uh, problems in the autonomic uh, uh, nervous system control. Now, um, because ultimately the goal of our brains is to reduce the inherent uncertainty of an, um, a changing environment, then if that doesn't function, your brain might um, prefer not to engage with the environment anymore and that might then lead ultimately to a depression. So if you look at the brain maps which are associated um, with depression, at least in a specific kind of depression, after a stroke in the brain, then your central executive or frontal parietal control network perfectly well overlaps um, with um, the, the areas in which a stroke will result in depression, meaning that indeed um, depression might be the result of a dysfunctional uh, control system where your frontal parietal control network is not capable of reducing the inherent uncertainty in the environment and therefore might uh, prefer not to engage with the environment anymore. Now, the uh, central executive network, if it, if it functions perfectly fine, um, then it will be able to help you cope with uncertainty in the environment. And this is um, one, uh, one way of doing that is, for example, uh, meditation. Meditation basically uh, suppresses the default mode and increases uh, psychological well-being by increasing connectivity between the default mode and the central ex executive network in which the central executive network is capable of, for example, su suppressing rumination, which is a, a consistent, um, long-lasting thinking, uh, mind-wandering about one specific uh, aspect that, uh, that is deemed salient at that very um, moment. So basically, the central executive network is, um, is helped by meditation to suppress rumination in the default mode and that will then improve your well-being. Now the, um, the frontal parietal control network is adjacent to, um, to, the, uh, to the attentional network because of course being capable of controlling um, salient or uncertainty information requires also that you can pay attention or that you can suppress attention um, related to uncertainty. And therefore the attentional networks um, involve the, the severe and, uh, inf and inferior part of the frontal cortex as well as severe and inferior part of the parietal cortex. So in this meta-analysis of attention, you can um, see that it is a um, uh, frontal parietal um, basically network, but that also involves the, the PCC and the precuneus and some um, uh, brainstem activity. So it has been uh, conceived of um, as a top-down attentional network, which basically involves the, uh, the the dorsal attentional network, which involves the frontal eye field and the um, the superior parietal area and then there is also a bottom-up attention which involves the temporal parietal junction and the mid um, frontal gyrus or the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex associated with the um, with the insula so the um, the difference between the dorsal and the ventral attentional network is in, um, in its function so basically your dorsal attentional network is involved in top-down attention uh, when you're uh, mind wandering, when you're thinking about how should I do something to reduce uncertainty in the environment, then this requires a top-down attention. Um, 
that um, attaches uh, behavior relevance in relation to the self and to the goal or the purpose that you have um, and therefore your eyes will automatically shift to what, your, um, what you consider important or behaviorally relevant in that moment in time. So the dorsal attention network involves the, um, the frontal eye fields and the superior parietal lobe. Um, in contrast to the ventral attention network, which basically is activated by bottom-up sensory stimuli that reorient attention. So basically that is a circuit breaker from a bottom-up sensory stimuli basically that tell you something important has occurred. This could be somebody calling your name or you hear somebody calling fire or you see a line approaching then something in your brain has to tell you well I should shift my attention to this more behaviorally important stimulus that is very salient and so this, uh, this is ultimately a circuit breaker uh, for bottom-up sensory stimuli and involves the inferior parietal area and the inferior to inferior frontal um, cortex. So, um, so top-down attention in, uh, involving the dorsal attentional system or the dorsal attentional network um, basically suppresses the, uh, the ventral attentional network and the salience network in itself will actually um, modify the ventral attention network or give information to the temporal attention network saying this stimulus is important so you have to uh, basically uh, modify or overrule whatever your dorsal attentional system is doing at that very moment. Now what is interesting is that this uh, bottom-up sensory driven attention of course also involves um, uh, context. If you're very thirsty uh, running around in the desert, then any sign of water is going has to be a circuit breaker and point your attention to it. Whereas if you're um, if you're somewhere um, almost drowning in the, in the lake, then probably that glass of water has, uh, even though it's the same stimulus, has no um, attentional um, priority. So the parahippocampal context will of course also determine in which way a specific stimulus can uh, modify the um, attention, uh, the ventral attentional network. So um, basically the, uh, the, the superior parietal area and the frontal eye fields, the, the top-down attention or the dorsal attentional system can basically reduce the ventral attentional system's um, activity, but also the other way around, the ventral attentional network uh, is capable of suppressing the uh, dorsal attentional network for obvious reasons. That if something uh, important uh, or behaviorally relevant or salient occurs, then of course the, the uh, ventral attentional network has to be able to overrule whatever you're thinking of um, or paying attention to internally in order to solve the problem. Now, um, basically the salience of the information, meaning uh, behaviorally relevant or uh, related to a specific goal, um, controls that balance between the, um, the superior uh, or dorsal and the ventral attentional uh, network. And so uh, the top-down attention can modulate both the sensory cortex and uh, contextual memory, um, which will then um, and provide information uh, that is important for the goal uh, that somebody is um, is uh, thinking of. So, if you're uh, thinking at a certain moment, I have to do this and this and this, uh, then you need to pull information from memory or from the environment in order to get. Uh, that um, that uh, goal and therefore your top-down attention modulates both the sensory cortex and the contextual memory. But as we've seen, the attention, the ventral attentional network and the dorsal attentional network will predominantly process information which is behaviorally relevant. For the dorsal attentional system, it is relevant in with uh, with 
regards to a goal or an intention that one has with the ventral attentional uh, network it is uh, the information is relevant if it has to circuit break whatever uh, you are thinking about so salience basically has two meanings it has a bottom up uh, meaning where salience is basically a physical distinctiveness of an object like this red dot in, in, uh, in contrast to the green dot so this is a bottom-up salience because it is uh, physically um, distinct uh, from the others whereas um, a top-down salience basically means that there is behavioral relevance uh, like this bottle of uh, water when you're um, getting lost in the desert and so salience basically um, means that it is behaviorally relevant or uh, very distinctive in an environment so it might be um, important to pay attention to it and that will then be processed with priority the salience network um, involves predominantly the rostral part of the anterior singlet as well as the uh, the anterior part of the um, insula but also the habenula as you can see here um, a little bit of the orbitofrontal cortex as well as the uh, posterior singlet now the posterior singlet is usually not considered part of the salience network and may actually be the link between the salience network and the default mode network so the salience network top-down salience network basically considering what is behaviorally relevant um, involves the uh, the rostral part of the uh, of the anterior singlet uh, cortex and the anterior insula um, in many studies you will see that that is the only two areas that they look at and uh, claim that this is the salience network but actually the salience network um, at least the top-down salience network also involves the amygdala and the, um, the, the hypothalamus the dorsal medial nucleus of the thalamus the um, the putamen as well as the uh, pre-SMA so from a practical point of view um, the salience network is more than just the rostral part of the anterior singlet and the anterior um, insula now there is some confusion as well about is the salience network exactly the same as the from as the single opercular network and it has been suggested that actually they're somewhat different um, anatomically that the single opercular network which is predominantly involved to maintain um, to maintain control of a task throughout the task um, in contrast to the frontal parietal control network which is basically involved in uh, changing um, information or more interested in changing information just like the salience network that there might be um, actually a dissociation of the single opercular network and the salience network but this is uh, not generally um, accepted the salience network in itself if you look is temporally extremely flexible in comparison to the other networks for example the blue network is the default mode network um, the, uh, the salience network because it has to detect whatever is behaviorally relevant at an instant of time is basically um, very flexible um, it has the highest level of flexibility of any um, areas and of course that connects to the ventral and the dorsal attentional network as we've, as we've seen before it informs the attentional networks um, whether there is important bottom-up information arriving or whether the top-down information is um, is important um, basically the uh, the interesting part of this um, of this high flexibility is that um, because of this rapid shift and it needs some very important uh, very fast information transmission and maybe that's why um, in those two areas of the uh, rostral anterior, um, anterior insula as well in the rostral um, singlet you have very large unique neurons which are called von economo or spindle neurons and they might just um, be there because they uh, allow very fast information transmission now the salience network 
um, is involved in somatosensory uh, processing, is involved in affective processing, is involved in cognitive processing, as well as in autonomic uh, nervous system, predominantly in sy uh, sympathetic nervous system processing. So the salience network uh, basically is involved in not just cognition, um, but also in infections and somatosensory processing, uh, typically in pain and um, in sympathetic nervous system processing. And the salience network has been considered very important for um, a lot of mental diseases and if you do a, um, a voxel-based morphometry conjunction analysis of axis 1 um, or what used to be axis 1 uh, psychiatric diseases um, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, addiction, com obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety what they all have in common is um, abnormal, um, ac ac abnormal structural uh, in in the uh, savings network. And this is very interesting because from a clinical point of view, most of these uh, pathologies actually have been treated with singletomies, and as we might see in the near future, actually might be treated with uh, singlet um, implants. This has been confirmed in other meta-analysis which basically extended uh, the pathologies that are um, that, ha that have involvement of the, um, the salience network, uh, but it makes it a little bit more, uh, more complicated. Now, from an evolutionary point of view, the salience network might actually be a part of this, uh, what uh, Paul McLean called the limbic lobe, uh, which is the emotional brain and basically function as a dimmer on, um, on sensory inf information, and this dimmer might be controlled by the cortex, the neocortex, which would then uh, allow you uh, to plan information. And so, of course, this salience uh, network might ultimately uh, have a dimmer function on, the, uh, on what is considered important um, to uh, reduce the uncertainty in, in a changing environment. Now, the anterior singlet complex um, is a has been called is called BA24 and but BA24 is large and it actually consists of um, at least four parts and these four parts um, are retrieved and confirmed actually by uh, a paper published in Nature by Glosser which shows based on um, uh, thickness uh, uh, connectivity and uh, myelin uh, concentration that there might be one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four areas um, of the anterior singlet, which we call the subgeneral, the pregeneral, the rostral, and the dorsal part of the anterior singlet. As we've seen, uncertainty, of course, involves the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, um, extending in some areas more to the rostral part of the anterior singlet and as well as the right anterior insula. So uncertainty processing might, uh, because of its connectivity from the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex to the rostral, might involve um, the uh, rostral part of the anterior singlet. And basically what it says is, I need more information. Uh, because this is uncertain and the area adjacent to the rostral part, the dorsal part, is actually probably the area that suggests that we need more information. Um, now, if you obtain enough information, then ultimately you can say, well, you can um, rest and digest, I've got enough information and this can then be pulled into uh, memory. Or if you cannot get the information from the environment, you may pull it from uh, memory. Now, if you have enough information, then that should give you a feeling of pleasure or hedonia by its connectivity of the pregenital anterior singlet to the um, to the oxit orbitofrontal cortex, and then of course you can suppress further information because you've got all the information that is required. So. Um, basically what it means is that if there is uncertainty, you need to look for more information. You're going to look in the environment for more information. This will um, then active give you a feeling of 
pleasure, but also tell you, well, I've got enough information and therefore um, you can say, well, store whatever, um, whatever I, I did related to this stimulus input in memory um, and um, rest and digest. However, if you cannot get enough information, then you will go into a vicious circle that will um, then um, ultimately generate um, stress. If there is enough information, it will activate the glia SMA to inhibit further activity. Now, in order to do that, those different parts of the anterior segment have different receptor profiles. Every part of the anterior and posterior segment has a different receptor profile, which of course allows you, um, or allows the singlet cortex to um, have its different functions. So um, just talking about the anterior singlet cortex really does not make, um, make any sense. As a practical example, uh, mu opioid receptors are predominantly found in the dorsal part, the subgenital part, and the posterior singlet. Um, dopamine D1 receptors are predominantly found in the pregenital and, um, and subgenital part. And remember, the dors dopamine D1 receptors are the ones that allow you to zoom in to focus on the most salient feature and you do that by suppressing all the other um, input and hyper focusing on what seems to be um, pre predominantly salient at that moment in time. Um, the AMPA receptors or um, uh, the glutamate receptors that respond very um, fast to, uh, to a stimulus and of course these are involved if you have to focus on, on something you need the activation to be associated with it. Um, alpha-1 receptors are high in the pregenital and the rostral part of the anterior singlet. Serotonin-1 uh, receptors are um, basically found almost um, everywhere, but the 1 receptors more anteriorly and the 2 receptors more posteriorly. Um, NMDA receptors are found uh, mostly in the, um, in the entire um, brain except in those two um, areas which are very important because this is the um, this is a, a, a most important hub for the sympathetic nervous system this is parasympathetic but it's because of its connectivity in the default mode network these might actually um, say well I have enough information I uh, need more information so a balance between these two um, is different from um, NMDA is devoid of NMDA receptors those two areas uh, do involve GABA B um, receptors um, and GABA A receptors are predominantly in the um, posterior aspect of the brain. Now, there has been a very interesting study which is uh, what is the most interesting part of the brain and so what uh, the way the, the authors looked at that is by uh, correlating um, voxels um, to the amount of uh, uh, times that they are noted in the literature and so uh, basically these are popular voxels um, and the blue voxels are, are not popular so if you want to publish something which is uh, not really commonly published about everything in blue may be uh, your uh, cup of tea if however you say well I want to write a, a, an important review then you might be interested in those uh, more popular um, areas. And, um, but if you're in interested in publishing in a high impact journal, then the impact journals uh, correlate to the voxels is basically the anterior singlet is very, um, very uh, important in the sense that those areas also get you um, into high impact journals. Now, of course, the anterior singlet in itself um, it's phrenologically interesting, but in itself it will not do anything except if that area is connected to an entire network. So if we start and look at the uh, dorsal part of the anterior segment, which basically, as we've seen, says give me more, um, and is correlated to the, um, to the insula and the sensory motor area and the auditory areas, and is anti-correlated to the default mode. So this, this, the default mode network is basically anti-correlated to the dorsal part of the anterior singlet, which is predominantly sensory motor and uh, salience uh, um, uh, correlated network. 
And the pre-general anterior segment is um, correlate with the default mode network, of course, because it's part of the default mode network, that makes sense, and is actually anti-correlated with external sensory input from the visual, uh, some of the sensory um, and auditory areas. So this um, the pre-general anterior segment is basically part of the default mode and is anti-correlated with sensory uh, input. The rostral part of the anterior cingulate basically is um, correlates with the with with the default mode, uh, at least with the medial part of the default mode network, as well as with the uh, insula. So basically, the rostral part is part of the salient network, which is um, in, at a resting state at least, uh, correlate with the default mode, uh, suggesting that at a resting state, when you're mind wandering, you're looking for. Uh, informa in, important information uh, that is related to whatever you're thinking about at that very uh, time. Now what is interesting is that this rostral part is also um, correlated with the subgeneral part of the anterior cingulate and the subgeneral part in itself is, is correlated with the uh, temporal tip or the frontal cortex and PCC so basically with a more emotional um, pathway. Now, uh, let's, let's look at a little bit in more detail for the specific part. So let's start with the pre-general part of the anterior singlet, which says, basically, to summarize its main function of the network that it's involved is, I have uh, enough. So it's, um, for example, in pain, it's called the descending pain inhibitory pathway or the antinociceptive pathway, and it is opioidergic, serotonergic, noradrenergic, and it goes from the pre-general anterior singlet um, to, the, uh, to the reticular nucleus of the thalamus, to the periaqueda for gray, to the rostroventral part of the middle of Lambata, and from there down to, um, to have an effect on the input area of sensory information from the periphery. So basically it blocks um, pain uh, inhibitory information coming from the periphery at the level of the um, of the thalamus, the periaqueductal gray, and the rostroventral part of the medulla oblongata. The, um, the pre-general anterior singlet is, anti is um, basically anti-correlated with the sensory information um, and is correlated with the dorsal part of the anterior singlet, which in itself is actually um, correlated with the sensory motor um, network and the um, uh, anti-correlated with the default mode. So what it means is that ultimately these two areas communicate and determine whether you will uh, look for more in sensory information from the outside or not. Um, so the dorsal part of the interior singlet is, uh, is important in your autonomic nervous system control um, whereas the posterior singlet is, in, is, is the main hub of your parasympathetic um, nervous system. Now this uh, network is, is uh, probably might be specific but in all parallel pathways because what you see is that this pre-general anterior singlet cortex extending to the rostral part actually um, is part of your descending pain inhibitory pathway as, as we've just seen but also involved in auditory um, descending uh, noise cancelling information. So if you have tinnitus, then the percentage of the time that the tinnitus is present, meaning the, the, the functionality of noise cancelling mechanism, if there is a deficit in a noise cancelling mechanism, then you will perceive the phantom sound or the tinnitus longer or more frequently than somebody in whom this uh, break, this uh, I have enough uh, pathway is still functioning. And the same has been shown in patients with intermittent vertigo attacks where um, the, the attacks correlate with the, the deficiency of the vertigo inhibiting pathway. And you can uh, take it even to the social domain where if you have a deficit in the pre-general anterior singlet um, so that it cannot control the amygdala anymore, then you're um, becoming more aggressive. So it's probably a general mechanism where the pre-general anterior signet connects to the uh, reticular nucleus of the thalamus, the periaqueductal gray in the somatosensory domain, just posterior of the periaqueductal gray, there is a tectal longitudinal column 
um, the ventral part, which is uh, involved in suppressing auditory information. And just behind that structure, there is a dorsal attacked longitudinal column, which is important in uh, suppressing visual information. So basically, all these uh, free general anterior segment inputs then go to the periaqueductal gray in parallel for the different uh, sensory domains, and from there, of course, via the brainstem uh, to the um, to the effector um, and receptor areas of the uh, sensory domain. Now, is this true, or? Um, from a meta-analytic point of view, and indeed if you do a meta-analysis, what you see is that the rostral part um, actually is important and the anterior singlet is important. So uh, in inhibition in general um, actually also involves the salience network, which makes sense in, uh, because it, if your brain says, well, I have enough information, this information is not behaviorally relevant anymore, then that will determine whether you can or cannot inhibit uh, further inputs of that information. So the um, pre-general anterior signal might actually, therefore, as a central control of saying, well, I have, enough I have enough information, might be also critically involved in um, what is called allostasis or preventive, uh, predictive reference uh, resetting. Um, and you see that in, in, indeed that if you um, if you pre your singlet is um, is hyperactive that uh, that uh, controls allostasis in the sense that uh, it will tell you well I've got enough information for now and um, in patients uh, with addiction that becomes decontextualized uh, suggesting that actually the context does not determine anymore how, whether or not you want more input and therefore you're more prone to become um, addicted. Now, let's move from the pre-general anterior singlet network to the dorsal um, anterior singlet network. Basically, that network says, uh, creates an urge for action, uh, give me more. And so, in, uh, in a conjunction analysis, um, where, um, where the authors looked at what the swallowing, uh, maturation, yawning, or the urge um, to tick into red syndromes, what do they have in common? Is basically the anterior uh, insula and the anterior singlet um, area, uh, the dorsal part of the anterior uh, insula area, that uh, creates this urge uh, to uh, swallow, this urge to yawn, this urge to go to the toilet, or the urge um, to express a tick. And basically, so the dorsal part is um, what creates this urge for action. Now, in order to have this urge for action, you have to mobilize the energy and get the body ready to do that. And therefore, it is unsurprising that it basically overlaps with uh, the dorsal part of the anterior insula in sympathetic uh, nervous system control. So, um, if the uh, pre general anterior singlet um, has been um, linked to a network that says, I have enough, and is a suppressive network, then the dorsal part of the anterior singlet is part of a network that says, I need more information, give me more. And of course, one way of um, saying I need more is to generate a phenomenological feeling of craving. And if you look at the meta-analysis of craving, you find indeed that the craving is associated with the dorsal anterior singlet component, um, as well as the nucleus accumbens uh, component, an amygdala component and a um, and a parahippocampal um, component that contextually says I need more um, input. Now, the uh, the pregeneral is involved in suppressing information. This one says um, basically give me more information, and the one in between the two is the one that says uh, which information is behaviorally relevant, which information is important which information uh, we should pay attention to and we should um, uh, we should address with priority and indeed um, this is both in a top-down and a bottom-up fashion um, as shown in this study where basically the anterior singlet um, and the anterior insula is activated by both visual stimuli auditory stimuli non-nociceptive somatosensory stimuli nociceptive somatosensory stimuli and so much sensory stimuli in general.
So, yes, um, this uh, rostopod reducingment is important um, both for a bottom up, uh, sorry, bottom up and top down um, sailings. And as mentioned, in order to be able to, um, to constantly monitor the environment um, as well as memory for what is behaviorally relevant, this uh, network is the most, uh, uh, has the most flexibility and this might be uh, related to the presence of von Economo um, networks. Now self-related uh, salience involves the, this uh, rostral part of the anterior salient and the anterior insula and of course salience by definition, behavioral relevance uh, has to be related to um, the self. So um, the uh, salience network also involves the habenula and the posterior segment because that is what links you to your uh, self uh, reference. Now, um, of course, what is important de depends on what is um, uh, what is uncertain in the uh, environment or what is changing in the environment and um, if you um, look at the, um, at the uncertainty in a, in a different uh, meta-analytic approach uh, where you look at not what is specific for um, uncertainty but what, is, uh, what comes up, what is associated with uncertainty then you do find that it extends not just in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, but it also extends into the rostral anterior singlet. 